Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, editor in chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, let it be. We've often talked about the many iterations of the OECD Inclusive Framework's work on the two pillar plan for updating the taxation of multinationals. But this week, we're going to drill down into one aspect of the plan, specifically, Amount B of Pillar 1. Here to explain what that is, why it matters, and where things stand is Tax Notes contributing editor Ryan Finley. Ryan, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. First, let's set the scene with an overview of the two-pillar plan. Sure. So the the two-pillar plan consists of Pillar 1, which is basically, as it now stands, consists of two amounts, amount A and amount B, as you mentioned, and pillar two, which is the minimum global tax regime. Now, amount A tends to dominate the conversation when it comes to pillar one, and that, you know, has to do with basically reallocating taxing rights to market jurisdictions, whereas amount B is is sort of a um, a streamlined way of applying the existing rules for uh, allocating taxing rights. So, what exactly are we trying to solve by putting amount B in there if there are already rules in place that deal with the issues? Right. So the, the, the existing rule you're referring to is the arm's length principle, which um, amount B isn't really so much trying to displace as it is trying to simplify. The idea is that there's basically this category of disputes, whether they're between taxpayers and tax authorities or between competent authorities in a a mutual agreement procedure case that are kind of more trouble than they're worth. The idea is that for a class of distributors, specifically wholesale distributors, they're referred to in uh, the OECD parlance as baseline distributors, that everyone kind of knows what return they should get under um, the method that usually applies to them, uh, the transactional net margin method, or TNMM. So basically... The idea is that the amount of compliance work that you have to do to apply the TNMM is disproportionate to the, you know, to the benefit. If we all know the answer, there's no need to do a, a, a comparable search for comparable companies just to get to the same result you knew you were going to get to to begin with. So the idea of Mount B is to basically make those disputes go away, make all that compliance work go away, and just sort of stipulate the answer to the question that we knew you know, was there all along. Well, if there is sort of a widespread agreement on, on how these should be taxed before Amount B is in place, why does it raise so many disputes? The idea is that um, everyone knows what the answer is going to be. In practice, it's a little more complicated. Um, you could apply the TNMM in a way uh, where you have sort of a, a small set of comparables where kicking out or including one potential comparable could have a you know material effect on the arm's length range and the, the return that the distributor should earn. So while it's kind of simple in theory, it can get more complicated, especially when you have obviously um, you have various uh, revenue considerations. I'm sure that affect the position that competent authorities take, and obviously taxpayers have their own uh, interest in in the outcome as well. So it's more about the specifics uh, of these disputes rather than the overall idea of what they're trying to do. All right. So let's turn to the the current state of play here and the recent consultation the OECD Inclusive Framework released about Amount B. What what is in there? So most of what's in this consultation document can probably go under one of two categories. The first is scope. Right, basically, all the conditions that you have to satisfy as a distributor to get into the Amount B framework. And the second category would be the pricing method that applies once you're, uh, you establish that you're in scope. So what sort of approaches are we seeing in this document? Right. So as we'll, I think we're going to discuss later, um, there's still some disagreement about what the particularly the scoping criteria should be. But most of the document, the consultation document, reflects uh, positions that, that seem to be shared from, you know, all uh, inclusive framework countries. For the scoping criteria, you first have to establish that you have what they call a, a qualifying transaction. So basically, 
you have to have a wholesale distributor as the tested party um, that's potentially going to, to get its return based on amount B. After you establish that you have a qualifying transaction, then there are a series of, as they call them, scoping criteria in the consultation document. And there are four that everyone agrees on, and there's one that, that they disagree on. But the, the four are basically, they're basically designed to, to kick out companies that are, are doing more than wholesale distribution in terms of like sales and marketing or that kind of thing, or performing unrelated activities. But once you clear all these, these screens, you establish what the operating margin should be for the distributor based on this, this table or what the OECD calls a pricing matrix. And you essentially have columns that are based on industry groupings that are supposedly correlated with profitability. And you have rows that are based on the ratio of uh, either operating expenses or operating assets to sales. And that's supposed to sort of be a proxy for how much the distributor is doing and how much, you know, what they deserve a return for. And based on where you fall in that table, you have a, a range of plus or minus half a percentage point for, you know, what the operating margin ought to be. So this is sort of, a, I dare say, a formulary apportionment system being placed into the transfer pricing realm? Uh, that probably depends on how you define formulary apportionment. I mean, there is, there is a formula, and it is the, the denominator is sales, but I, I don't think this is normally... This is, I mean, the whole idea is for this to be inserted into the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. It's certainly not meant to be formulary apportionment, even if there are formulary aspects of it. So where do things stand on the negotiations on this? You know, what, what, are, we, what are we looking for to be resolved through this consultation? Right. So as I said, there are, there are four screens that everyone agrees on. And it will probably help to go into a little bit of detail on them. The, the first screen is meant to kick out distributors that perform or they make unique and valuable contributions. Um, that's a, a, a term of art in the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. And it, it basically, it, it covers entities that, that you, you essentially, they, they, they do things that are, contribute to profit significantly and that are unique. So you can't really benchmark them using comparables under a method like the TNMM. So that's your first screen. Your second screen is a filter based on operating expenses divided by sales. And like I said, in terms of the, the pricing matrix, that's supposed to capture you know, the extent to which the distributor is doing things other than kind of just moving goods along. The cost of the goods would be cost of goods sold. So whatever's operating expenses presumably reflects additional activities. The final two screens that it seems like there's consensus on knock out uh, distributors either of commodities or services and distributors that perform unrelated activities that kind of can't be disentangled and pr separately priced from the distribution activities themselves. The term is uh, aggregation and again in transfer pricing parlance. The idea is that if you can't disentangle these unrelated activities that you can't, you know, you can't reliably apply this amount B pricing method. So the, the big disagreement is about this, this one other scoping criterion. And the, the consultation document explains that, that this is kind of the, the point of divergence between what it refers to as alternative A and alternative B. Under alternative A, you don't need any additional screens beyond the ones that I described. The, the supporters of alternative B think that you need an additional qualitative filter to kick out distributors that, however defined, perform more than baseline distribution activities. The countries that support this view think that the first two filters, the one-sided method filter and the operating expense intensity filter, that they're not going to kick out all of the distributors that shouldn't be under the amount B regime, and that they need this kind of qualitative backstop to eliminate companies that 
maybe will survive those first two screens, but nonetheless should not be um, eligible for a Mount B. They make a couple arguments for this that at least appear in the consultation document. One is that um, they think that taxpayers could manipulate their accounting cost classifications so that you know costs are either you know attributed to operating expenses or cost of goods sold depending on what you know the desired outcome would be. And the other objection is that the operating uh, expense intensity really doesn't have a, a well-established statistical relationship with returns. Alternative A supporters, which include the United States, say that if you have this kind of mushy qualitative filter on top of everything else, you know, it's not only kind of redundant, but it, it undermines the whole purpose of, of the project, which was to, you know, simplify things and provide a streamlined method. If you have a highly subjective qualitative test that basically asks whether the distributor performs non-baseline activities, whatever that exactly means, then you might end up sort of having the same disputes that you were trying to get rid of just in a new form. Now, do you see any way for these two parties to come together and resolve between alternative A and alternative B? Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question. There was an earlier consultation in 2022, and if you compare the, the two consultation documents, there's clearly been a lot of progress on Amount B, where you had, it was very, very vague uh, in the last consultation document. You have a much more refined proposal. There's clearly a lot of common ground. But at the same time, this, this dispute over whether you need an additional qualitative filter, it's a pretty fundamental one. And signs are that countries are, are kind of digging in their heels on it. I think there's still a fair amount of optimism that you know, some kind of agreement can ultimately be reached, but it's going to require a resolution of a, you know, a pretty divisive uh, question to get there. Now, this is in the context of a much bigger project. You have the, you know, the, the rest of Pillar 1 and you have Pillar 2 going at the same time. Is it necessary to resolve this in order to get the entire package completed? It's not necessary uh, in any sort of legal or technical sense, uh, what would happen with Amount B is you'd have guidance that would be inserted into the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, which essentially represent kind of like an extended commentary to Article 9 of the OECD Model Tax Convention. So really, as I was saying before, it's just as a means of implementation. You don't need treaty amendments. You don't need to introduce uh, extensive changes to your domestic tax legislation as you would require under Pillar 2. So you really wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, nothing about Amount B requires resolution of these other issues. And I don't think, you know, the, the fate of Amount A or of Pillar 2 will really be determined by what happens with Amount B either. So what is next here? What, what should we be looking for to happen uh, in the coming months? The consultation period runs through September 1st, so the, the OECD will be um, gathering uh, stakeholder comments until that, that time. I think the idea is for them to come out with some sort of guidance by the end of 2023, although that sounds a little bit ambitious in, in light of um, the OECD's track record uh, in terms of meeting deadlines and also in terms of, as I was saying before, resolving a, a pretty knotty issue. So. Um, I think the timeline will be probably dictated by the ability to reach a sort of political agreement. All right, Brian, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we'll definitely have you back as we get more answers on how this is going to get resolved. Thanks. And now, coming attractions. Each week we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief Paige Jones. Paige, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Matthew Wilds wonders if the basis of stock should be adjusted for inflation. Hale Shepard explains how the IRS is shifting its focus to original landowners in its easement disputes. In Tax Notes State, three Withers practitioners explore the U.S. and U.K. inheritance and transfer tax law pertaining to Prince Harry and Meghan Markle in the second of a two-part series. 
Mark Grossman examines the growing issues for online sellers regarding sales tax nexus for digital sales. In Tax Notes International, Daniela Frescorato and Federico Bartolomiazzi review the European Commission's recently published directive aimed at improving withholding tax relief procedures within the EU. Mindy Hersfeld explains the current rift between the U.S. and the OECD. She outlines potential steps to close the gap and encourage a better working relationship. In featured analysis, Nana Amasarfo takes a look at the OECD's latest report on developing countries and the inclusive framework. And finally, on the opinions page, Marie Sapiri examines the development of guidance implementing the Clean Hydrogen Credit. Robert Goulder comments on Canada's push for a digital services tax. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at tax stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.